Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second uh, half of the uh, Chapter 45 Endocrine System Lecture. So here we pick up with neuroendocrine connections. So how the nervous system communicates with the endocrine system. So the nervous system has all sorts of receptors all around the body to detect what's going on, and then it can relay messages to the endocrine system to release hormones to cause the body to respond in certain ways. So an important connection here is between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus gets sensory information from all over the body and makes decisions about how to respond. And then it sends a signal to the pituitary gland, sometimes called the master gland, that has anterior and posterior lobes, and then they release all sorts of different hormones that have different targets around the body to do different things. So this is sort of a nice uh, illustration here showing how you can get all sorts of sensory input from around the body in the hypothalamus. Then it will stimulate electrical signals that cause activity of uh, different tissues in the pituitary gland. And then the pituitary gland is going to release certain chemicals into the bloodstream. And then all those different hormones can have their various impacts. So the hypothalamus detects and decides. It relays a message to the pituitary gland. And then the pituitary gland can release all sorts of different uh, hormones in the body, allowing the body to respond. So let's look at some examples. Uh, a common example is the thyroid gland uh, as it relates to body temperature or metabolism. So this is a really good example of a negative feedback loop. So here again, we see the hypothalamus. Uh, sometimes people refer to it as like the, the thermostat uh, in the brain. It can detect changes in temperature. So if the body starts to become too cool, the hypothalamus detects that, and then it sends uh, a hormone to the pituitary gland. Now, the pituitary gland releases uh, a hormone. It's called thyroid-stimulating hormone. And thyroid-stimulating hormone is going to travel to the bloodstream to, you guessed it, the thyroid gland in your neck. The thyroid gland then releases another pair of hormones, uh, these T3 or T4 hormones are also called thyroxin. Uh, so these T3 and T4 hormones then dock on target cells all around the body. And what they do is sort of uprate, or I'm sorry, upregulate um, cellular metabolism. So they crank up the rate of chemical reactions. And of course, one of the byproducts of chemical reactions is heat. So it's going to warm the body. So again, the hypothalamus detects, it releases this thyrotropin releasing hormone to the uh, pituitary. Pituitary releases thyrotropin, which is also called thyroid st stimulating hormone. That goes to the thyroid gland in the neck. That releases these other hormones, the T3, T4s. And then those dock uh, on receptors and cells all around the body and cause it to cause those cells to rev up their metabolism and it's going to warm you. Now, this is an example of negative feedback though, because what happens is these hormones, the T3, T4 hormones or thyroxin hormones, they will actually inhibit the pituitary from releasing TSH. Uh, so um, if that happens, then that sort of prevents the overproduction of T3 and T4, so the body doesn't overheat. Uh, now, sometimes people have um, thyroid conditions like hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. One thing that can happen with people is their immune system attacks uh, the tissue in their thyroid gland, and when the um, immune system attacks the tissue in the thyroid gland that causes inflammation and that causes an overproduction of T3 and T4. So their, their thyroid glands will overproduce these hormones. Well, imagine the effect that that's going to have on the body. It's going to make their body warmer. Uh, it's going to increase their metabolism. It can cause feelings of like jitteriness or nervous, nervousness or trouble sleeping. So people whose thyroid glands are under attack uh, by their immune system uh, sort of have these uh, symptoms. Again, you know, elevated temperature, so they're warm or hot. Um, they have high metabolism, so they might lose weight. They're nervous or jittery, have trouble sleeping, things of that nature. But what happens is after the immune system destroys that tissue, then the thyroid gland is ruined and they don't produce the T3 and T4 hormones. So what happens on the flip side of that is after the tissue is destroyed and they don't make those hormones, their body will be cooler, so they'll be cold. They're going to feel lethargic and tired. They'll gain weight, and they may experience things like depression. So then what people can do is take 
things uh, that are mimics of those hormones. Uh, levothyroxine is an example of like a synthetic uh, T3, T4 hormone. And so people can um, take that uh, medication. Uh, let's see. So let's say uh, like what ifs. If a person's thyroid gland is destroyed by their immune system and they're experiencing hypothyroidism, think about what would happen to TSH levels. If they're not producing T3 and T4, then you don't have this inhibition on the pituitary gland. So they're going to be cold. The pituitary is not inhibited. So they're going to produce excess TSH. Their TSH levels will be elevated. Uh, then if they start to take these T3, T4 synthetic hormones, uh, then that should rev up their metabolism. It will also inhibit the pituitary, so their TSH levels will drop back down. So if a person has a suspicion of thyroid issues, uh, then they'll go to the doctor, the doctor will do a blood draw, and they're basically going to look at what are your TSH levels looking like. Okay. Uh, let's see, the AP curriculum also looks at lactation. Uh, lactation is an example of positive feedback. So if we look at the pathway here, the suckling of the infant uh, is detected by sensory neurons that communicate, again, with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus tells the pituitary to release oxytocin, and then oxytocin causes uh, cells in these alveoli to contract, and that causes ejection of the milk. Well, if you're releasing that milk, that's going to cause more suckling from the infant, and Increased suckling from the infant is going to cause release of more oxytocin, and the more oxytocin is going to cause more milk letdown or the release of more milk. So you see this positive feedback loop occurring where more and more milk is being released, causing more and more suckling until the kid gets full and, you know, detaches and the stimulus stops. Um, now, oxytocin affects other things as well. Uh, not only does it cause um, the contraction of those milk ducts to uh, force the milk out. It also, suckling causes the release of prolactin, uh, a hormone that causes uh, increased milk production. Um, another fascinating thing about oxytocin is uh, sometimes it's called the love hormone uh, because what oxytocin can do is also cause feelings of like warmth and connection uh, between individuals. So sometimes we'll talk about how nursing causes bonding between mothers and infants and that's because of this release of oxytocin. Um, oxytocin is really wild in terms of its connection uh, between people. So if people have like, you know, loving, caring relationships with one another, it can actually stimulate oxytocin release and they feel closer to one another and it physically makes them feel better. The release of oxytocin causes the release of dopamine, which helps a person feel well. And so elevated oxytocin levels can actually reduce stress, decrease blood pressure, you know, all these things are, are documented in, in women who breastfeed uh, with their infants. You know, it actually lowers the blood pressure of the mother, uh, lowers her cortisol levels, and does similar effects with infants. Um, a similar thing happens when people interact with and pet their uh, pets, like, you know, petting a dog uh, actually causes oxytocin release in individuals, and it makes them have reduced experience of stress. Um, people can also be affected by like oxytocin and, uh, uh, eating because what eating can do when the, the food gets into the small intestine, it causes the release of this hormone that's cholecystokinin or CCK. And that CCK will stimulate the vagus nerve to travel up to the brain and ultimately cause the release of oxytocin. So the person can feel better. So sometimes people feel better when eating, uh, because of the release of oxytocin. Um, also, physical contact between people, you know, like people you know, that, you know, have close relationships and hug one another um, actually cause the release of oxytocin, which can, again, reduce stress. So I know with pandemic stuff, uh, you know, people have less physical contact with one another, and that can lead to elevated levels of stress. Um, but, you know, oxytocin, you know, if you can get its release, can actually be very good for people. Uh, one, other th one last thing, this is all just sort of fascinating to me. Um, one thing that some research has indicated is that holding warm beverages when people are talking to one another can actually stimulate feelings of connectedness between the individuals. So if people are like holding a warm, you know, mug of coffee or hot chocolate or whatever, um, 
as they interact with one another, it can stimulate the release of oxytocin between individuals. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways to get your oxytocin dosages, uh, but, it, you know, it's good for people. Uh, now, oxytocin also plays a role in childbirth, uh, another example of positive feedback. So, you know, babies, they're all head, right? They've got these gigantic heavy heads. So near the end of gestation, the, the uh, fetus will turn upside down, and then the head of the, the fetus will push on the cervix, uh, the, the lower part of the uterus or the neck of the uterus, and then that will stimulate uh, the release of oxytocin. Um, so when oxytocin is released, that can cause uh, the contraction of the uterus, as well as the release of these other hormones called prostaglandins, which cause more contractions. When you get more contractions, that's more pressure on the cervix, uh, which causes the release of more oxytocin, which leads to more contractions, more pressure, and you sort of see the, the feedback loop that occurs there, right? So you get contractions that last longer, get closer together in time until the cervix is completely effaced or thinned out, uh, or, you know, the uterus is basically opened up and then you can start like active pushing. And then, you know, the mother will push the baby out. And once the baby's pushed out, of course, the stimulus is gone and eventually contractions subside. So wild how oxytocin, you know, this one hormone, uh, can cause all these different, um, responses. Oh, one other thing with oxytocin is that it can also, um, diminish experience of pain. Now, of course, you know, childbirth is in a, a, an extreme situation, but people can actually have higher pain tolerance and deal with pain better uh, if they have oxytocin release. So, you know, connection and, uh, you know, people that you have good relationships with can, can do so, so much for us. All right. Uh, another hormone that they look at uh, in the curriculum is the SRY gene um, and its uh, impact on uh, development of uh, the gonads. So you guys have listened to the podcast. Uh, again, in the developing embryo, look how cute that little shrimp is. Uh, but if you look, here's the sort of primordial gonadal tissue. So that's sort of the undifferentiated tissue that become the gonads. And what happens is these little germ cells travel up from the allen allantois, this sort of waste sac, up into this sort of region that will become the gonadal tissue. And if the SRY gene is present, then that will activate uh, genes that cause that gonadal tissue to become testes. If the testes are present, then they'll produce testosterone. And if testosterone is present, it causes basically the plumbing to develop as male plumbing. If the SRY gene isn't present, then the body will uh, have that gonadal tissue develop as ovaries. And then with the ovaries, you'll have uh, different sets of sex hormones that are produced. So whether this gene is there or not is going to sort of influence the production of different proteins that ultimately uh, lead to differentiation of the gonads. All right. Uh, let's see. Definitely know your sugar stuff. Uh, the thing to always just keep in mind, you got to keep it at 100, right? So your blood sugar stays right at around 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, now... What happens if you eat a meal? Well, if you eat a meal, your blood sugar go to, is going to go up. The pancreas releases insulin. Insulin causes cells to take in sugar or to store sugar as glycogen in the liver. And of course, blood glucose levels then fall back down to homeostasis. Well, what if you've gone a long time without eating or you've been exercising? Your blood sugar drops below 100, so the pancreas releases glucagon. Glucagon causes glycogen to be hydrolyzed or cut apart and glucose to be released back in the bloodstream. So blood sugar goes back up to 100. So uh, again, these are antagonistic hormones to keep you right at homeostasis. Uh, here's an interesting point to look at. Uh, it is how the same hormone can have different effects. Adrenaline, think of all the things it does to your body, right? It makes your pupils dilate, makes your heart rate increase, uh, increases your metabolism. It makes blood vessels in your guts narrow, but blood vessels in your extremities dilate. So how does one hormone produce all these different effects? Well, one thing to keep in mind is you can have the same hormone, the same signaling molecule, the same receptors, but different cells are going to have different combinations of proteins in them. If you have different combinations of proteins in the sides of the cells, it's going to lead to different signal transduction pathways and ultimately different responses. 
So here you can have glycogen breakdown in one cell and blood vessel dilation in another. They have the same receptor. They get the same hormone, but because they have different proteins inside the cells, it's different signaling pathways. Another thing to pay attention to is different receptors. So you can have the same signaling molecule, adrenaline, but different receptors, and different receptors will lead to different responses. In this case, some blood vessels dilate, other blood vessels constrict. So signal transduction pathways depend on a lot of different factors. And that's a, what they're sort of getting at in this. Uh, so you can have the same ligand, you can have the same receptor, but again, different combinations of proteins inside the cell, it's going to lead to different responses. Uh, you can have the same ligand and different receptors. And again, that can lead to different responses. And again, we've also talked a little bit about uh, crosstalk where uh, if you have one signaling pathway working, uh, another ligand can dock on a different receptor and you can have the same protein in the signaling pathway interact with different pathways and that can either boost or decrease uh, the original pathway. So that's why you got to watch out for like drug interactions, right? Anytime you're taking medications, you talk to the pharmacist and see if the, the drugs may interact with one another. All right, we've been talking a lot about hormones in mammals or animals. Now we're going to look at hormones in plants. So we'll look at just a, a few of uh, my favorites here. The first is auxin. Auxin causes plant cells to divide and for stems to elongate. So this is pretty cool. Um, you see that at the, it's called the apical meristem, at the, the tip of the, the growing plant, you have a high concentration of this auxin hormone and it makes the cells there divide so the stem lengthens. Now what's cool is sometimes plants will grow toward the sun, right? Well, what causes that? Hormones. So here, if we see the sun is at an angle, the auxin will concentrate on the side of the plant that's away from the sun. So it stimulates cell division on the side of the stem that's pointed away from the sun. So the plant will actually bend toward the sun. Plants change their shape because of hormones. Uh, another cool feature of auxin is this idea of apical dominance. What happens is at the apical meristem, uh, the tissue where you have the auxin being produced, it causes rapid cell division, so it grows up, 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 up. Not only does the auxin cause the stem to grow up, it inhibits lateral meristems. It inhibits uh, tissues uh, from, from developing that make the plant grow out. So the plant focuses on growing up before it grows out. So what happens is as the stem gets longer and longer and longer, well, of course, the concentration of auxin is going to diminish the farther and farther you get from the, the tip or, or the, the dividing tissue. When auxin levels decrease, well, then you start to get lateral growth and things grow out. So if you think about like a, an evergreen tree, evergreen trees have sort of a pyramidal shape, right? Oh, that's a bad pyramid. They have a pyramidal shape because at the growing tip, you have that high concentration of auxin, which is making it grow up, but it's preventing lateral growth. Down at the base of the tree, it's far away from the, the, the apical meristem, so there's less inhibition, so you get lateral growth. So that's why you get that sort of pyramidal shape in like an evergreen tree. Now, practical implications. You've got some bushes at home, and you want your bushes to be even bushier. How do you get your bushes to thicken? Well, let's think. Trim the bushes. If you use hedge clippers and trim the outside of the bushes, what you're going to do is cut off the apical meristems. So if you do that, it's called decapitation. If you decapitate the apical meristems, you get rid of the auxin. If you get rid of the auxin, then there's no inhibition on lateral growth. So the bush grows out and it, it gets thicker or bushier. So in the spring, if you want to like get more growth, make your bushes not necessarily bigger, but thicker or fuller, you just trim them and that causes more lateral growth and um, you get fuller bushes. So again, plant hormones. Uh, abscisic acid. I think of this as like the brakes. It's putting the brakes on uh, plant growth. What abscisic acid does, again, multiple things, but one thing that abscisic acid does is it closes the stomata or the little mouths on leaves. If there is uh, uh, drought stress, abscisic acid can cause the stomata to close and if you cause a stomata to close, then it prevents water loss. 
Uh, now, of course, if you do that, it prevents carbon dioxide from getting in, so it slows plant growth, uh, but it does prevent the, the plant from losing too much water. Uh, abscisic acid also promotes seed dormancy, so you don't want seeds to start dividing uh, too early or when they're inside the, the, the fruit. So abscisic acid keeps those seeds dormant until uh, the appropriate time for the seed to begin to germinate. Uh, finally, the abscisic acid uh, hormone gets its name in part because it promotes leaf abscission. So like in the fall, when there's less sunlight, photosynthesis will stop, chlorophyll will break down, and like the tissues in the leaf will die. Well, what happens is abscisic acid levels will increase, and it basically severs the plumbing, uh, the xylem and the phloem, uh, the little tubes that connect the, the leaf to the rest of the plant or the stem of the plant, and uh, it will actually uh, cause the breakdown of that stem and the leaf will fall off. So abscisic acid is pretty active in the fall. Finally, ethylene. The way I remember the effect of ethylene is I think old and ethyl. Okay, So what ethylene does is it promotes fruit ripening. And this is another example of positive feedback because when a fruit starts to produce ethylene, what it will do is release this gas. This is actually a hormone that's a gas. And what that ethylene will do is it will make neighboring fruits also begin to ripen. And as they ripen, they're going to produce more ethylene. And as they produce more ethylene, they ripen even faster. And it sort of spreads throughout uh, the organism. So, you know, if you get apples in an apple orchard uh, all ripening at the same time, it's because this ethylene gas is being produced and it has this positive feedback loop. It's also why, like when you're storing your fruits, you usually store them in an open bowl because if you keep your fruits in a closed up bag, as they start to ripen and produce ethylene, if you trap that ethylene gas, well then you're gonna make the fruit ripen even faster and it'll rot sooner. So a lot of times fruit bowls sort of have like an open design to promote airflow. Uh, and if you promote airflow, then uh, that sort of reduces the concentration of ethylene and um, the fruits won't ripen as quickly. So uh, that's it on hormones. Woo! If you wouldn't mind, please take a moment, summarize the big ideas from this chapter. There are just tons of examples. The College Board has really likes looking at hormones and the signaling pathways. So just familiarize yourself with them. Think about the what ifs, and then that should help you out. Get ready for the test. Thank you so much. Have a great day.